All right, hello everyone. Welcome to another session of the Friday Transportation Seminar. Uh, my name is Dr. Jenny Liu and um, I'm in the School of Urban Studies and Planning and I host this seminar together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Miguel Figliozzi at the, and the School of, uh, or the Department, School of Civil, <laughs> Civil Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering. And today um, we are continuing on our student series from um, the TRB presentation. So um, up first, we have a doc doctoral student from um, the School of Urban Studies and Planning, um, Kelly Rogers, and she'll be presenting on defining place. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to Kelly. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I am looking at place types. Are people familiar with the idea of place types? Just a show of hands in the room. Couple, okay. <laughs> um, so I've been uh, very interested in this idea, which is um, in the built environment. So the idea that the built environment shapes our travel decisions is a pretty big idea. It's the most studied aspect of kind of urban and transportation planning. And researchers generally kind of distill <coughs> the variables that uh, affect travel behavior um, into um, five Ds. Oftentimes, there's also many other variables. Um, and some researchers are starting to look at things called place type or neighborhood type, or more simply kind of context. How does context affect travel behavior? So if you implement a certain kind of transportation strategy or intervention in one kind of neighborhood, will it have the same kind of effect in a different neighborhood? And you know, what accounts for those differences? And then planners and practitioners are very interested in this question because it suggests that there are different policy options or uh, decisions that they would make if they're trying to have, if they have goals around reducing uh, vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions or improving walkability or things like that. So that's kind of why it's interesting. Um, but the question kind of remains, if, if we know that these variables, the five Ds, which is, you know, destinations, density, diversity, uh, distance to transit, and some other one that I'm forgetting, you know, if these are the things that predict how people travel, why would you bother to put them into place type? Um, I made a little footnote here too that of course, sociodemographic factors and attitudinal factors also make a big difference in, in people's travel decisions. But for the time being, I'm kind of focused more on the built environment aspect of it. So one researcher, Song and, um, researcher Song and Nat, they um, kind of t justified their approach to doing place type and saying that um, for one, it's an ease of understanding for practitioners. It's easier to say, you know, this kind of neighborhood or that kind of neighborhood versus outlying the degree of different kinds of, um, you know, of how each variable operates in that neighborhood. You can just say type one, type two, type three, or something like that. But the other um, uh, part of it is too that um, if you're doing modeling work, you could have, 5, 10, 15, 20 variables to try to predict how people will operate or behave. Um, and that gets to be really challenging in a modeling environment. So the idea is you can reduce those into something that's a little simpler for analytic purposes. And the last ones are just like, as I mentioned before, it's easier for planners and practitioners to understand um, place type as a way of kind of just doing practice out in the world. Um, for research purposes, what's interesting about it, as those five variables, um, while you study them in isolation, they actually um, potentially interact. So this might be kind of intuitive if you think about, if you just increase um, density in a neighborhood, is that necessarily gonna mean that people are gonna use more transit and drive less? They kind of need to have access to transit for that to work. You also need destinations probably that are nearby for people to access. So if you just have huge swaths of residential, that's probably, you know, if that's the only policy variable that you're tinkering with, you might not get the outcome that you want. And so, um, you know, so they're not additive either. They can also be synergistic that way. And there might be threshold effects. So some researchers are looking at, you know, can you get density to a certain level and you have 
um, a big effect on VMT or street network design or something like that. Um, that was the fifth D that I forgot design. Um, so, you know, how do they all interact? Do they amplify effects? Do they diminish effects? Are there certain thresholds where things really matter? So this is what um, more recently researchers are starting to dig into. And so what I have been doing is trying to figure out how these place types are constructed, what, by what methods, and when are they used. There's several different kinds of place typologies that are out there. Um, and this was just a very preliminary um, exploratory kind of review for me to look at how these are constructed and understand this slide really wants to advance on its own, um, how they're constructive. And so, you know, early iterations were very binary. Um, there's composite measures, categorical measures. There's more design approaches for ways of understanding place and neighborhood. And my goal in this, in the kind of the long run, is to kind of figure out what place typology best explains travel behavior um, very generally, and it's like practical, practical for practitioners to use as well. And, um, and just briefly for context, um, the idea behind this research is that it informs this research synthesis tool that I'm developing called Street Smart, which takes the empirical evidence of the relationship between different transportation strategies and shows how it affects different community goals. So this is an example. It's a prototype, it's in prototype form right now. This is a, the web page from your traffic calming if you were to search for a transportation strategy. And then you can see that there's different, well, you can't really see very well, but um, for how it affects different goals that communities have around vehicle speed or crash data, other things like that. Um, maybe this is a subtle way of it telling me to hurry up. Uh, so anyway, what I'd like to do is that this is a contextual. So this is the effects that happen kind of regardless of where you are. But the reality is that we know that things um, behave, you know, people behave differently in different contexts. So the idea for me is I would like to be able to expand this dashboard that I have that is general and actually have a menu of effects that you could say in a downtown environment or in a rural, well, or a suburban environment of this sort you can expect that the effects might vary in a different way. It's a very long-term goal. But that just gives you some context for what, where I'm going with it. Um, so there are a few different factors that I looked at in my review. Um, there's the unit of analysis, and there's this issue of a modifiable aerial unit problem, um, where depending on where you set the boundary, you might get different results. Um, this is an illustration that was in Planning Magazine in October that um, kind of illustrates different ways of depending on how you draw the lines or how you do the boundaries, you can get really different results in your study. So this comes up a lot of the time when we we're looking at, are you looking at census tracts? Are you looking at census blocks? Are you looking at parcel level and developing a buffer? These are all different sorts of areas and boundaries and methods that were used in the studies that I was looking at. Um, there's just a more general issue of scale People that are interested in walking, for example, as an outcome of interest, that's a local neighborhood scale where those where that things make a difference. Like walking to local destinations is a really big um, independent variable that you want to be looking at. For VMT, on the other hand, sometimes those local things don't make as big a difference as the regional scale. So what kind of boundary you're set is, relates to the outcome of interest that you're studying. So I'm really interested in, you know, do you have to create a new set of areas for study depending on each variable that you're looking at, or there's some areas of overlap or way that they can nest. And then the last issue is residential self-selection. This kind of comes up a lot in the transportation literature. We're dealing with cross-sectional data generally, which is not, you can't really infer causation from that. You have correlation um, and whether or not Sociodemographics or attitudinal factors are really the thing that are kind of driving travel decisions. So it's like you might be living in an area that's very walkable and bikeable, but if you're predisposed to driving, you're just going to drive or you're going to choose to live in a neighborhood that lets you drive with greater ease, you might perceive as greater ease than in a neighborhood that doesn't. So that also can be a complicating factor when you're trying to tease out all the things about travel behavior. So and these were all addressed more or less in some of the 
studies that I looked at. So um, as I mentioned before, the five Ds were used pretty much in all of the studies that I looked at um, with all of the various different approaches. Um, if people were interested in walking or kind of a, have a more design orientation, they were in, interested in other things around um, aesthetics, pedestrian amenities, um, and other kind of things related on a much more fine scale, things that are much more difficult to capture on if you're looking at a larger area. Um, and other studies looked at things like housing, age, and vacancy, single family, that or not. And sometimes that's kind of used as a proxy. So you think about kind of post-World War II development and that kind of housing patterns and street patterns that were that came from that so that you could almost, and some people kind of did use that as, a, as part of their binary constructions for place type. Um, so really quickly, um, I'm just going to talk about a few of the categories. I'm not going to go into each study. Um, so there's the urban design type, and this is a more intuitive way of looking at the built environment. So if you're a designer in particular, you're kind of looking at the environment and making some decisions about what this looks like. And um, an example of this is the uh, rural to urban transect. Is anyone familiar with that? Kind of comes out of the Congress for New Urbanism, kind of a new urbanism study of thought. So um, it's got, you, you know, T1, is your transect is your most natural zone. It goes to rural, suburban, et cetera, um, until you've got your urban core, and then they've got an extra, like, special district, something that doesn't fit into one of those. So, um, you know, this is something that is used pretty frequently. It's been pretty influential because it was kind of, I guess, early in the study of travel behavior in the built environment. And so aspects of it have been incorporated into other typologies. Um, but the Pennsylvania and New Jersey DOT have um, transportation guidance that kind of refers you to this transect. So does um, the Washington Department of Transportation and some of their guidance. So it's usually used for something when people are more concerned about how a street fits into neighborhood character. And so it's a little, there's sort of a presumption that it will create more walking and that it might reduce vehicle miles traveled. Although again, the scale of decision, like of, of being able to measure VMT is really different for that, for walking. Um, but that's typically how that's employed. And then we have more data-driven types, and um, the early stuff tended to be binary, as I mentioned before, where it was kind of urban-suburban, or neo traditional and conventional, or something like that. So it was not a, you know, uh, super nuanced way of looking at it. And, um, and some people uh, have resisted that work. So later iterations of this kind of categorical approach um, use things like cluster and factor analysis to help define neighborhoods. And sort of briefly, when you've got, as I mentioned, if you've got too many variables, that gets really complicated for modeling. And so to reduce that, they use a factor analysis that sort of reduces it because these things tend to be um, correlated with each other. Um, and so they reduce the number of factors and then, uh, and then with the cluster analysis, they try to discern what are the unique types? What has the greatest amount of similarity and differentiation from another type? And that's how they generate the, the types. And so this tends to come up with more like five to seven different place types. And the researchers are again starting to look at like, how does this vary by place type? And how does it vary by type of trip? So um, Deborah Salon, for example, was looking at work and non-work trips, for example. Like, how, how do these place types have a different kind of travel behavior effect? And then categorical approaches, just quickly, are also good for some modeling. Like, if you, and this is not an area with which I am very familiar, but discrete choice modeling or something, things like this, you need categories, not a continuum, to be able to, to kind of do this. Um, so again, depending on the application. Uh, and then quickly, composite approaches so um, there's some researchers that kind of resisted the categorical approach, saying you're just leaving out too much information. Some, some places just don't fit into buckets. And so it's better to think about it on a continuum. And so um, there have been other types that have done this. Um, and then here at PSU, Gerke and Clifton also did something similar. 
of kind of creating this smart growthness of a neighborhood. That's not what they called it. That's what I'm calling it. Um, to help predict walk mode choice and trip frequency. Both of these use structural equation modeling as the way that they kind of constructed their types, if you're interested in the methods. Um, and then lastly, we've got area and development type. I didn't know what else to call this, but some of this early work from this actually came from a federal SHARP-2 research project, and there's a document called the Effects of smart growth policies or something like that, I can't remember the full title, um, that created a uh, uh, this scheme of types. And it was derived from a lot of different places. Caltrans has a smart mobility framework that has a lot of different place types. They looked at that, they looked at something like a transect, and then they kind of mashed that up um, to create their version of place types. And so it's, it's area type, which is a little bit more about centrality about your location being in the center versus the periphery of the city. And then the development type is more residential employment, mixed use. Um, they have a special category around transit oriented development. Um, and it's census block group level information. So locally, the Oregon Department of Transportation has created their own place typology and they actually piloted the SHARP-2 approach in Oregon to try to you know, classify every part of the state as in place types. And, um, and then they ended up kind of adapting it with some local data because data, the national level data wasn't fitting perfectly. Um, so they have a very similar kind of construct, only it was expanded. The mixed use, I think, had a high density and low density version of mixed use, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so in the end, you have 16 typologies, types in this typology, um, which is, you know, interesting to me, again, thinking about practitioners, like, is that helpful to have that number of types to be working with and having policy decisions that might depend on 16 different types? It's just a question that I have. I don't know. Um, so with that, I'll just say in terms of what I'm going to be looking at here on out, um, is uh, again, kind of looking, exploring that unit of analysis and scale question around tracks versus block groups, scales for walking versus VMT, which are a couple of outcomes of interest that I'm most interested in. And, um, and also looking at those threshold effects because um, I think that would inform how boundaries are set in terms of your place typology. Um, and then I did a little bit of work on this um, for a class paper, actually, of whether or not place type has a mediating or moderating effect uh, in terms of uh, VMT. Um, and I looked at sort of an adapted ODOT typology to see, you know, the presumption is that it has a moderating effect, that the built environment variables are kind of the primary determinants, but place type sort of modifies how that plays out on the ground versus a mediating effect is like, Actually, you think it's the built environment variables that are predicting travel behavior, but it's actually place type that's the better predictor. So um, I would like to explore all the different kinds of typologies and kind of see how, how they work with regard to this. Um, again, with a long-term goal of trying to figure out what typology best explains the two outcomes of interest that I'm exploring. And I think we have time just for like a couple of questions, um, but I also have my email addresses there if anyone wants to get in touch. How do you see the, the kind of website tool that you're being most effective for planners and Yeah, I'm, um, so there's a few different ways. I've been doing focus groups with engineers, planners, advocates, and, um, and they're all looking at it in a little bit different way. Um, so advocates and some planners are interested in kind of making the case for certain kinds of investments. So I'm trying to reduce risk for planners and engineers by showing them that this is something that has worked in other places <coughs> so they can innovate beyond what's kind of conventional for their particular you know, context. Um, others can see it as a way to help do a prioritization of if you've got a laundry list of projects to fund for a city and you have uh, are starting to set targets because we're now entering into a performance-based planning environment, which is pretty new for a lot of municipalities and MPOs, then 
um, you can do kind of a preliminary screen of the kinds of projects that have been shown to help meet the goals that you have. You might have to do a more robust analysis later on to determine if the final selection of the project, but it could be done that way. And a lot of people just see it as, I mean, my kind of goal actually is to help people connect the dots between a given transportation intervention and the effects that it has across a multitude of different areas. And some people aren't always thinking about that. If they're really focused on a safety project, I want to remind them that there are consequences for greenhouse gas emissions, health, equity, other things like that. So some people have suggested that it would really be great for planning advisory groups, people that are interested in the in this subject, but they don't have a lot of training in transportation and don't understand how these things all interrelate. So um, in your further uh, in your research, you're thinking of kind of exploring this unit of analysis. So say, um, so I'm just kind of speculating here, but um, say you come up with um, a particular unit of analysis that seems to be the most ideal, say like block or, or block or whatever it is. Is, um, is this type of research going to inform the researcher as to if I have data limitations and I'm not able to reach that ideal unit of analysis, how I might adjust for that or how I might consider what are the differences? Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, I haven't really fully conceptualized what that research would look like except for maybe comparing, like doing something at a census tract level and the same thing at a block group level and see what those differences are. And if I do that enough times, I might be able to discern a pattern where I can say it tends to inflate this or obscure this kind of thing based on that. So be mindful if you are forced to go into one scale of analysis that maybe is not ideal, then know that these are some of the things that you might be missing. So it's very interesting, but maybe you can elaborate on the validation procedure that you want to follow. Um, because so, it's very challenging, maybe with BNT you might have internal and external things. Yeah. Or you might have BNT total versus BNT per capita. And, you know, there are so many things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just kind of explain what I did for my paper a little bit. Maybe, yeah, I think validation can look like a lot of different things, but so I looked at, instead of like the ODOT typology, I actually used Brian Greger's Oregon Analytics. He uses a smart growth, you know, smart location database from EPA and then census block group level data. Um, and so I was interested in seeing, um, Yeah, well, that was more testing for mediation and moderation, I guess, but like taking that information and there's a little bit of a circular logic challenge in that the variables that create place type, um, you can't use those same variables for testing because um, you're going to find that they're the same. The mediation, the moderation effects are the same. So I kind of had to use proxy variables that re were very similar to see how that worked. Um, and then found that it had a more moderating effect. But I think there's still the circular logic problem that happens because you're using some of the same very similar constructs for it. Um, and then the other validation testing question is, yeah, kind of, and again, I haven't fully thought out this line of research of, of trying to look at observed what predicted and observed travel behavior are and how well that relates based on um, the different place typologies. So using different types of place top typologies in the same space and seeing which one seems to line up the best. But I haven't gotten very far in that line of thinking. Great, thank you.
this right in there. Well, uh, hello to everyone. My name is Jaime Orrego. I'm a PhD student here at PSU. Uh, I'm glad that you invited me to the Pipe Seminar. It's my first time here. Uh, so, thank you. <laughs> but I'm going to present this work that we have been research researching over a year uh, with co-authors Patrick Singleton that used to be like a PhD student here. Joe Totten, that is a master's student, and Bob Schneider and Kelly Clifton, that both of them uh, are professors, one of these, you, well, Patrick also is a professor, but uh, they are like the co-authors, so I want to acknowledge them. Uh, the title of this work is Density Difference for the mid environment relationship with working between and within metropolitan areas. So <clears throat> the first thing that I want to start this like presentation is that we have developed this pedestrian demand model too for Portland for the last like five years before I arrived here. And in this tool, we have like managed to build a indicator of like how probable is that the environment is going to like cause uh, walking trips. And this indicator is called pi, the pedestrian use of the environment. And we set up to be a score between 20 and 100. And you can see here in Portland how is the pi indicator of how probable it's going to like uh, generate um, how probably is like people are going to walk and you can see like in the downtown you have a high pi and then going to a suburb you get a lower pi. So like our first problem or idea or question is like can we extend this approach to other cities? And so we have been like trying to uh, answer the last uh, year at least. So this is like a quick, uh, very quick synthesis of like what is like the travel behavior on the built environment. Probably this is some of the same things that Kelly already told you, uh, but this is a little bit different approach, but. The idea is that the travel behavior on the built environment, like they usually assume that the attributes of the built environment are linear. So it doesn't matter uh, where I'm in the city, it's going to like increase in the same kind of slope or number. And usually also on the literature focus more in the whole region and doesn't consider too much like different, the large urban spatial structure because it's different like thinking, uh, I don't know, a city like Los Angeles or New York, right? So like the follow-up questions is, does the relationship the same in downtown than in server, suburbs? Like this different like uh, with environment characteristics, can we model that with just a linear model? And does the relationship like stay the same even if the structure between cities are different? Like a downtown versus uh, a more dense place than a more spot place? And as a motivation, I just put these like maps. Well, I'm also from Chile, so we have included like the the Santiago, Chile, a little bit in some of this research. So you can understand that, or the question is like, you have Los Angeles and Santiago. Los Angeles has twice the population, but it's more than twice the size. And you can see this map shows like in green, the more dense places and in the same scale, and in red, the more, the not such a dense places. So would you say that the built environment affects the same the travel behavior in those green places in Los Angeles and in these red places over here, and it's the same? Would you say that Los Angeles share the same urban structure as Santiago? And um, I wouldn't think like that. So <laughs> the idea is to differentiate those urban structures. 
So what are research goals? Like, we want to understand how our measures and our models are different in different locations and between the same cities. So the first like, question, are these relationships even applicable within the different environments in Portland region? Will you say that in, in the whole Portland region is just one number or one linear model? And the second is like, if this relationship in Portland holds in other places. So, so for the methodology of this study, we managed to like construct a unique data set for several metro regions. Uh, we we found out like look at for the household travel surveys that have like trip and data and then we match that with the billion marmot characteristics at the block wood level in the census data. Then we identify the key variables of the built environment, and this is like a different perspective of what Kelly was like showing. Uh, this are more uh, larger scale. Then we estimate univariate binary logics for, for those of here that are not familiar with those kind of models, they are like just probabilistic models that are going to relate how the attributes of the environment, such as like uh, population density or employment density, cause a probability of what? And this is the same that these creatures models that also Kelly mentioned before. And we want to compare results across and within metro areas. It's more or less a straightforward methodology. Um, so the first thing I want to show you is like the, this is the, the, like the starting point where we are. We have the pie levels and we have like this pie is our indicator of like pedestrian kind of friendly or probable place to work. And you see that this is compared the pay, uh, pie levels of each block group compared to the amount of working trips or the working share that are in each block. So you can see that clearly there's like a, more or less a steady state until like 550. And then we, when we jump to like a higher level of pie, you can see a lot of more work. So this is like our first like need to think that you can see two different regimes. So there's definitely not linear relationship between working on the building environment. That's like the best case that we can think about this work. So what happens if we compare this to different cities? I don't want you to think, to see this graph and think about the values. It's only like the differences. So this is the, the coefficients for the univariate choice models. And you can see that in the overall for all the cities that are in, in the study, the larger, the coefficient that is the largest is the population list. So this also like make us a thing that the most important variable for, or the, the variable that is blending the most, like the working chances in a neighborhood is like the population density. And it's, it's important to say that we don't think that the only, the only important variable is population density, but we think at least it's like the basis where you can start. And of course that's reasonable because you want people, you need people to be there like in order to be working. Right? And then you see like in all the other coefficients, there's like a lot of more differences. And you can see like this, like constant or similar uh, behavior. And then when I, so in, in that sense, we are now analyzing how the population density has our key variable uh, change uh, and or how working, the working church change through the population density. So here, this graph show like we group all the block groups by population density, and then we estimate, or well, from the travel server, we estimate the amount of walking. So you see that in block groups that have five people per acre, you can see all this amount of walking, and so on. So this is the case for San Francisco. And at the same, that with the pie level, you see like there's a more steady state like at first, and then there's more noise. When we see like other cities, for example, this is Seattle, 
again, you see like a more less noise at the first, and then you see more variation. Again, you see this in Portland, in Los Angeles. It's interesting how Los Angeles is, is very like, uh, it seems like almost a line, and that could also be because Los Angeles has a, such a big sample that is more or less uh, like have very little noise. You see San Diego, and finally, and this is the interesting thing, Santiago. Uh, it's interesting that here we find like there's like a similar behavior among U.S. cities, and Santiago, that is a different city, have a very different behavior. Uh, it's important to know that probably in the U.S. cities, almost all people live, 80 or 90 percent of the people live under, in, in areas that are under 30 people per acre. But in Santiago, it's the opposite. Like almost all the people live over 20 people per acre. So. Like population in the U.S. is around here, while population in Santiago is around here, or even more dense. And this like show you like the trend. This is just the graph and a trend line. So don't think this as, as a model. It's just to to like a line and to see how similar is the behavior in the American cities and how different it is in Santiago. And of course, Santiago being a more dense uh, city, like the incremental, the marginal increase of like the attributes of the real environment uh, affect less like the probability of working. So like getting deep in this idea of like, um, of understanding that there are different regimes or different like behaviors within the cities uh, you see that when we separate the sample, like in two levels, the R square of like the suburban or less dense places is more, it, it has a better explanation of like the probability of walking than the higher density places that have a lot of more noise. So this is like this plus the pi indicator graph, like suggest or give more evidence about like, definitely this is not a linear uh, behavior. This is not a linear phenomenon. So it's interesting or important to differentiate these ideas. So what are the key findings? Um, so there's less variation in population density, like the, there's less noise and more explanation of like the population density lower in lower density places. And we think that this is the most planetary viable and it's consistent with the pi measure that we have already modeled uh, for port. The relationship of working and employment, retail services, and intersection density, and human transit are more varied relationships. So we can, we can not yet like understand so well how these variables affect working. But within the US cities, uh, we at least identify two regimes, and I probably it's better to say that we identify a low regime, and then we have a lot of noise in the higher density places. So at least we have like two regions. And we have a linear effect in lower than cities, or we would say that this is a urban context that is up to 15 or 25 people per acre. Above that threshold, the effect is less clear. So that's the, it could be a more reduced, like, and probably if you like see this, this thing in like different cities around the world, you're going to see like that each city might be in a different regime. And also we have to like uh, say that as the US cities have a low, uh, uh, small amount of places in higher density, the sample of like the travel surveys might be underrepresented. The higher density places might be underrepresented. 
So that might be also uh, why there's so much noise in the higher density place. In Santiago, we see less variation in working with density patterns. So for example, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend in Santiago that the problem of working is having more density. Uh, while in the US cities, I would say that because the marginal increase in density is not going to change a lot the working behavior. So our conclusion is that in terms of child behavior, um, different build environment response um, or the build environment, the travel to the build environment depends on the larger urban structure. And this is like the same to thinking about that picture of like the map of Los Angeles and the map of Santiago and seeing how they are different, so the response is different. We definitely think that or we have evidence to say that there's the non-linear theories exists and that at least uh, in the lower lower density is more linear and after that we don't know. And in terms of transferability, we think that across the US cities, uh, between suburban areas, we can find like a consistent model that is transferable. Um, of course, there are different scales, like the density in Los Angeles, probably even in the downtown is larger than in Portland. And the same Portland, the activity or the intense of activity density in the downtown is smaller than in Seattle, for example. And there's not evidence to show that anything of the US cities compared to Santiago. And then our case would say that there are different regimes. That for the future work, uh, we need a better representation of household by like inherited density environments, at least in the US. Uh, so we're thinking about the next child service in the future. Uh, or how can we find other data sets that help us like to build better, uh, well, be better data accounting for those like limitations in the trial service. Uh, we want to also criticize this urban spatial structure, these gradients of density or like how walkable are places differ within cities. So we have to incorporate that in our mode. Also, we have to test complementary among build environment variables uh, because in this work, we have been isolating each variable and comparing that by working, but probably there's a lot of complementary among variables like employment density and population density and transit frequency, of course, all together they have an effect. We have, of course, account for these different regimes in our model, and we want to reconstruct risk made by in different regimes. Uh, because we have already, we have only done this for Portland, and we have to build this for also, and to test this like comparability idea that we have, and that's all. Thank you. Of course, there's a, a thing about car ownership. Uh, definitely, Santiago has less car ownership than, than the US city. But if you compare, for example, in Santiago, there's a part of the city that's called Itacura that is a very high income place. And then in 2001, when was the child survey that we're using here is in 2012. And 2001, they have already one car per person in that place that is a big thing in municipality. And then when you see like the the like time series of in, in, in that place you can not really have more cars because everyone has one car and then they haven't built really more roads so you can see in that place that they increase walking and increase bicycle so i would say that more than car ownership is also like 
the building of roads or highways, and also that's a problem in Santiago because the urban highways are new compared to the US, so they have like 10 or 15 years. So, but definitely I can't want to choose a variable that we have to move. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was the uh, the explanatory power, apparently, of uh, distance between intersections in Minneapolis St. Paul specifically. Do you have any guesses like why that happened? Well, uh, not really, but we have some problems with the Minneapolis service because there's well, no, actually, I I haven't like noticed like. So um, I relay a question from one of our online viewers, uh, from Marcio. So um, they're asking, why do we assume that the relationship between the built environment and the walking mode is linear, and what would happen to your model results if it's not? So, no, but how, all our fun is really that it's not linear. So, I don't get the question. So, the thing is that usually all the work that we have read or have been reading about this is like saying that there's a like elasticity parameters that are in this content between cities. So, we are saying that that's not the case. So, at least in this slide, uh, Graph version like two different means where you can find a linearity in, uh, in a small part of the uh, <coughs> spectrum of the virus. So, our argument is not, it's not linear. So, I don't know that person can do more details. I have a question. I remember that in your built environment, you have four uh, index such as population. Population density, employment density, and the intersection density. But in your results, but, uh, as to the uh, most shared, you only choose the population density yeah. as, the, uh, as the, the, the factor to influence the most shares. But what about others? No, yeah, maybe it wasn't clear at the end that our work, like. The next thing is like going to the other variables and see how complementary they are. But of where, and maybe it wasn't also clear, but we don't want to say that the population density is plain uh -huh. all the walking. And this is perfectly it's the same that Kelly was saying before, like how, for example, uh, the place assess are like the. Uh, but the thing is that uh, we think that. At least you have to have like the basis to see walking if you have to have a minimum density. And that's what we are saying. And then of course all the other variables have a role here. And we have to explore them. Hi Jeremy, thanks for the talk. Uh, as you know, I come from Lisbon and we've been doing similar research uh, with a totally different index for walkability. <coughs> we've come up exactly with the same relationship which is nonlinear, has around 50% of walkability. Which corroborates with that, it's uh, so it justifies why I'm here, by the way. That <laughs> I should uh, also use the, the PI model and the PET model, so that uh, it's, see how it works with a new European city that is very dense and uh, very different uh, in terms of topography and uh, urban uses and so on. So, uh, but one thing that is different is that we use the countings in segments and you use model shares. Okay, well, well, well. so does that kind of relationship uh, uh, appear with countings or, or only trips? Did you look at that? Like counting benefit on the screen? Or trips ah. instead of shares. Now taking into account the relative effect of all the models. Here we are, we are just estimating the amount of trips and divided by the total trips, so still more trips, no. You're, ah, you're saying, ah, I don't understand that. Uh, uh, it's just a question. Yeah. So then you have the problem that 
in different urban contexts, people can make the same amount of trips. So that's yeah, an interesting point because maybe you just don't want to have like a higher uh, workshare, you just want more people working. Yeah, or standardizing in another way, I don't know. Yeah, well, achieve the same relationship occurs. I mean, it just, I can't do the math slide just like that, but I mean, it, it's the trick is because we didn't have that option, because we didn't have more to share. But it's interesting to see that it, it comes up with the same relationship. Yeah, that, that would be a very interesting graph. I don't know if it's linear or not. Yeah. yeah. And, um, oh, yeah, so did you look at the outliers in the regressions? If you have any outliers, yeah, we have outliers. Did you look into those? What happened? Why there are outliers? So, for example, when you don't group them, uh, yeah. this graph is when you group them like that. Let's see the level. Yeah, you see more or less like a yeah a general pattern. But if you don't do that and just graph each block group, yeah. You see a lot of other layers, and there's like a lot of walking in a very strange places in Portland. Yeah. And the thing about grouping is that you can solve those other layers. Yeah, yeah, I understand why you did it. But uh, from this analysis that we did, because we did that, we, we went and looked why we have outliers. And you can learn a lot of them about them. Because it's like in places where you have higher walkability, they don't walk. And in places where you don't have high walk or low walkability, there's lots of people walking. And it's interesting to see why that happens. Yeah, but that literally probably is because I think that here we are a, a mesoscale. Oh. So we can identify those like outliers, and probably if you go to the micro scale and the place type, mm -hmm. we're going to like understand okay. better yeah. why there's more people. Okay. But in the general pattern, yeah. you can like identify these numbers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um. 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 Um.